want you to know that here at this church, we love you. And we care for you. First and foremost, because we see the example of that from God's word. This clip tonight touches on a few things as well as the song we just sang. It touches on a few things that I think are really important for us to deal with. The reality that people in our lives let us down. People in our lives fail us. They don't step up when they should have stepped up. They may have lied to us. They may have dropped the ball over and over and over again. They may have forsaken us, abandoned us, cast us aside, and left us. But the reality is, is that there is a God. There is a Father who takes you in. When sinful human beings are not what they're supposed to do. There is a father that takes us in. In our text that we're going to read, I'm going to read verses 9 and 10 of Psalm 27. We've been in Psalm 27 for five sessions now, and we're in verses 9 and 10, but I, I want us to understand before we read it, David is pouring out his guts. He is pleading with the Lord. He is begging the Lord. And at the same time, he is reminding himself of the goodness of the Lord. So let's read these two verses, then we'll look at them together. Verse 9 of Psalm 27 says this. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help. Cast me not off and forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. First thing I want us to talk about is the fear of abandonment. The fear of abandonment. I have said multiple times over the last few years as I have studied the Psalms that I really, really appreciate the realness of David. David doesn't try to, to hide stuff when he's writing his songs. See, here, here's what I think here's what we would do. We would write our songs and we would make sure that everyone had the best impression of us in the song that we write. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a song when I was first starting out in the ministry. Uh, it was called Desperate for You. And I, I'm desperate for you. And I remember that song being sung, and I remember thinking, I don't know if I can sing that all the time. And then I had to realize, well, I need to make it a prayer instead of making it a declaration, because I don't always, I'm always desperate for the Lord. And, but that's kind of what I think we would do, right? We would write songs that, that make us look really good, because we would put on the best face. Well, David doesn't do that. David is willing to completely get real when it comes to how he's feeling. In his songs, and in his, in his poetry, he is not afraid to lay out his fears, to lay out his troubles, and he does it again and again, and he does it here. Verse 9, he lays out four things that he's afraid of happening. Four things that he's pleading with God not to do. Number one, do not hide your face from me. I don't think David is just saying this. I don't think David's going, you know, I don't, I don't, this... I don't have any real fear that this is going to happen, but, you know, maybe I'll just write this. I, I think David really, his emotional experience is, I am afraid that God is going to hide his face from me when I need him most. In verse 8, we have just read that God says, seek my face. How ridiculous would it be for God to say, seek my face, and then God hide his face from the people he just said, seek my face from. But... The truth is, even though David may know that God wouldn't do that, he still is afraid. There's been so many times in my life where I knew in my mind the truth, but that didn't mean my emotions roll with it. Right? My mind can tell me all the truth in the morning when I go to counseling. Um, and I remember when I was going every single week, my, my counselor, he, 
he said to me, he said, Neil, I'm not going to kind of tell you the truth in here. I'm not going to quote scripture to you. I'm not, he said, you're a pastor. You already know the truth. He said, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to, to get our emotions, our affections. We're going to have to deal with those things. And David knows the truth, but his emotions are, he's still fearful of this. This is a genuine fear that David has. That it, when I go to seek the Lord, the Lord may not be there for me. Have you ever felt like the Lord was distant from you? Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like God was really, really distant from you? Where you wanted to walk with intimacy with, with, intimacy with Him, but you felt so separated, so far away. And you may know God's not hiding His face from me, but that doesn't mean that's not how you feel in the moment. The second thing he's afraid of, he says, turn not your servant away. So not only don't hide your face from me, don't turn me away. David was fearful that the Lord would turn him away. By the way, the Lord has already done this to the king that came before David, King Saul. Do you remember what God does to King Saul? He takes his spirit from King Saul and he turns King Saul away from him. King Saul was a, an idolater and a sinful man. Of course, David is not blameless. And so David knows, man, what about my sin? What about my struggles? God, please don't turn me away. It is common um, for us to feel that way. David is not going to presume upon the grace of the Lord. He knows the Lord does not have to be gracious to him. Even though the Lord has been gracious to him in the past, he doesn't just go, well, God, God, God be gracious to me. He didn't just presume on it, right? And just go, well, you know, hey, God's gracious. So God be gracious to me. So I'll be I can do whatever I want. That's not David's attitude. Even though the Lord has been his help in the past, he says, you have been my help. He still says, turn not your servant away in anger. Have you ever felt like because of your sin and your wrongdoing that when you come to God, God would turn you away from him? You ever felt like that? You ever felt like because of your sin, because of your weaknesses, because of your struggle, that when you come to God, God would turn you away? That's a, that's a genuine, real fear that people have. A genuine, real fear that God would hide his face and that God would turn us away. The next one, cast me not off. Cast me not off. The, the language here in the Hebrew language, this probably means a temporary uh, separation. What David doesn't want is David doesn't want there to be one second where he feels separated from the Lord. He doesn't there want there to be one minute. I, I thought about this. I thought, okay, um, it, this is probably like in the realm of, let's say you're in class and you're acting like an idiot, which I know no one in this room would ever act like an idiot in school. Oh, you're funny. Trash. And, uh, <laughs> this kid um, this happened to me a few times. Where the teacher looks at you and says, I need you out in the hallway. <laughs> What'd I do? That's the fact when everyone, nobody ever does anything. It's like, I need you to stop right now. I, I need Neil, I need you to get out, out in the hallway. What'd I do? What'd I do? Get my books, go out in the hallway, shut the door really hard, you know, loud, and just trying to. There's a, that's a temporary separation, right? Eventually, I'm coming back into class. It may be the next day, whatever, but eventually, I'm coming back into class. <laughs> David, when he gets in a tough spot, he does not want the Lord to desert him even for a split second. Have you ever felt like the Lord wasn't there? Or maybe the Lord was there, and he's just not answering your prayer at the moment. Where like you know that he's there, but you feel like your prayer is not, like there's, it's just not going anywhere. The, the relationship doesn't seem to, to go anywhere. As if God was just silent. Number four, forsake me not. David knows that the Lord is the only one who can save him. Right? He 
knows the only one that can save me is God. He says, you are the God of my salvation. You are the only one who can save me. The only one who can come through. So the thought that he would be permanently separated from God is his biggest fear. It happened to Saul. He doesn't want it to happen to him. The thought that there is a chance that I could be permanently separated from God was, was David's biggest fear. I, I think this word forsake has that idea of permanence. David knows I cannot live without God. I can't do it. I can't live without him. And if he forsakes me, I'm done for. Have you ever felt like the Lord has forsaken you? Have you ever felt like the Lord has left you in the wilderness of the world by yourself? Now, as I went through these questions, I want to just be honest with you for a few seconds. I have felt all four of those things in my life. I have felt at times that God was hiding his face from me. I was going to him and needing him, and he felt like a million miles away. There's been times in my life because of my own sin and because of my own wretchedness and walking in the flesh that I come to God and I'm so fearful that God's just going to get you make me sick. Yeah. You just, I can't stand you failing over and over and over again. Get out of here. There's been times in my life where I was afraid that for a, even a short period of time, God had distanced himself from me. There's been a time in my life where I thought, what if God just abandons me completely. Now the truth is, in my mind, I know all the promises of God's word. I know everything that God said about not doing that. But experientially, that's what I was feeling. I remember when my anxiety got really, really out of control five, five years ago now. I remember that first week that my anxiety was, was, I don't know what was going on with me. My medicine was messing me up and I was just a wreck and a mess. I remember walking this church parking lot, just walking it over. If you ever had anxiety, you know, or you're like, you can't sit still. You just got to walk and you just got to walk. And I'm just walking this church parking lot. And all I'm praying over and over and over again is, God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forsaken me? In my, that's how I felt. I felt like God was so far away from me. And he's hiding his face. He had turned me away. He had abandoned me, forsaken me, and cast me out. That's how I felt. Now, I knew in my mind that wasn't true. But I was afraid. I think that's where David is. I think David is emotionally saying, this is how I feel. And then, this is the next thing I love about David. He does this over and over and over in the song. He pours out his emotions like he's writing a song, right? So he's writing a song. He's pouring out his emotion. He's pouring his guts out to the Lord. He's telling the Lord this is how he feels. And then what he does is he reminds himself. He preaches to himself. So he says, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what I think. I feel like God's doing. Lord, please don't hide your face. Please don't cast me away. Please don't turn away. Please don't forsake me. And then he stops himself in those emotional moments and he preaches to himself. One of the keys to the Christian life is being a good preacher to yourself. Look at me. You've got to be good at preaching the truth to yourself. Most people are horrible at this. Most Christians are horrible about this. Do you know what we're really good at doing? Preaching the truth to somebody else. Well, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. You need to quit acting like that. Your attitude sucks. You need to stop it. You've been a jerk lately. Like, we're really good at doing that with other people. What we're not good at is preaching the truth to ourselves. David is a master at preaching to himself. He's a master of it. He does it over and over and over again. And he does it in verse 10. So here's his guts, right? He's pouring his guts out. Lord, don't hide your face from me. Please don't turn me away. Please don't cast me away. Please don't forsake me. And then he stops with all that emotion and he's going to speak truth to himself. And here's what he says in verse 10. My 
father and mother have forsaken me. Now I want to say a few words about this. Look at me and listen. I want to say a few words about this. One mistake people make in their relationship with God is they look at earthly relationships and then they project onto God how the earthly people have treated them. This happens so often with fathers. Listen to me carefully here because some of you are going to be in danger of doing this if you don't listen. Some of you have a horrible relationship with your father. Your father has not demonstrated to you the qualities of God the Father like he is supposed to. Which, by the way, is the calling of every father. Every father is supposed to, well, let me say this. Every father is always speaking about who God is to their kids. Either negatively or positively. Always. Okay? That's why, as a father, when I mess up with my kids, I've got to go and apologize and make it right. I can't just act like the sin I just committed against you by losing my temper or raising my voice or treating you harshly. I've I, I got to go and, and make that right because I need them to know that's not God. That was me. That's not God. But what happens is, is that a lot of fathers, they don't project the truth of God the Father. And so what happens is, is that people project onto God the Father the way they feel about their earthly father. And even earthly mothers at times. Right? However, the authority figure has treated me, it is so easy to project that onto God and be like, you know what? My earthly father has abandoned me. God may abandon me. My earthly father has been abusive. God will be abusive. My earthly father is hateful. God will be hateful. And it's so easy to do that. Now, listen to me. What we have to do is we have to know the character of God from His Word, and we have to know the reality and the truth of who God is. And we can't project onto God stuff that other people have messed us up. We can't do that. It's a danger. We've got to guard ourselves against it. Now listen to me here. I don't believe David's parents really abandoned him. There is no evidence in Scripture that that was the case. Okay? So what is David doing by saying this? David says, for my father and mother have forsaken me. But there's no evidence in Scripture that it actually took place. So, so what is it that David is trying to get across? Here's what I think he's doing. He's saying, if, but by the way, is it a parental, a parental, is that a right word? Oh, that's right. Okay, that's right. Parental, that's the right word. Uh, English. Uh, parental relationships with their children ought to be the most secure relationship a kid experiences. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen a lot, but it should be, right? We can all agree with that, right? A father's love for his children, a mother's love for his children ought to be the most glorious earthly relationship anybody experiences. That's the way it should be. Now, I know we live in a broken world, but that's the way it should be. So here's what I think David's doing. David's saying, listen, if even my father and mother abandoned me, if even the, the relationship where that should never take place, if it does, so here's what I think he's doing. I think he's saying, if my father and mother do this, and certainly anybody underneath that, right? He's basically taking all human relationships and he's rolling them up into a big ball. He's saying, listen, earthly father and mothers and any other relationship like that. He's just throwing it all into a big ball and he's saying, listen, if everybody who is supposed to love me abandons me, God won't do it. That's what he's saying. If my mom and my dad and my siblings and my spouse and my friends and my co-workers, if everybody in the world abandons me and I am standing here all alone, there is one who will take me in, and it's God. Everybody else can go by the wayside. God never will. And I love the language that he uses. He says, God will take me in. I love that. Is that not beautiful language? Right? Where he's saying, listen, everybody else is throwing me out. Everybody else is saying, get out of here. I don't have time for you. I'm not going to love you. I'm not going to care for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon you, forsake you, hide, turn you away. You get out. And God says, 
David is saying, if everybody does that to you, God will say, I'll take you in. I'll bring you in. Nobody else may, but I will. I'll take you in. I love this language. This, by the way, is the language of, of a father, an adoptive father, bringing in abandoned children. So the video clip, right? It's the reason I picked that video clip because this girl comes out. They've done all the paperwork. She thinks her mom's finally going to bring her back. She gets out there and her mother is back doing drugs again and she's not going to take them in. So she runs and she hides because she thinks she's been abandoned one more time. And this mom and dad go and seek her out and grab her and bring her and said, you are our family. That's what God has done for us. That's what God has done for us. The psalmist says in Psalm 68, 5, Father, that, that God is the father of the fatherless and the protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. We saw this, how God takes in Moses. Remember what, what Moses' parents had to do? They had to put him in a basket because they were going to get killed. They had to put him in a basket and sit him down the river. And what does God do? God works everything out to preserve Moses and keep Moses. Do you remember what happens with uh, Hagar? Listen, please. Boys, listen. Remember what happens with Moses and uh, with uh, Hagar and Ishmael, they get sent away by Abraham and Sarah, and they have to go, and they think they're going to die, and God comes and preserves them and keeps them. Of course, this is all based on the goodness and graciousness of the Lord, because he is good and gracious. He takes in all those who come to him. Listen to me. No one. Look at me right in my face. Everybody, look at me. No one who has ever come to God seeking his face has been turned away. Never, right? Ever has that ever happened. God never says to somebody, I know you need a home. Sorry. He's never done that. Anyone who comes to God gets God. Everybody. Now, I can't leave without giving the greatest example of this. The greatest example of this is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, you have it there in your notes. Galatians chapter 4. Listen, listen to what Paul writes in Galatians. Chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. He says this. Listen carefully. But when the fullness of time had come, it means when the right time had come, God sent forth his son, his Messiah, his king, Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Listen to that. Who does God send? Not a trick question. Who does God send? His son. Jesus, his son, right? To provide a redemption so that people who aren't God's sons become God's sons and daughters. It blows my mind when I can say, I'm a son of God. That blows my mind. Because I'm like, wait a minute, Jesus is the son of God, yet I get to be called a son of God. Like, that blows my mind. I'm like, what? Now, I'm not the son of God, but I'm a son of God. Why? Why can I say that? Because because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because what Jesus did, Jesus makes it possible that God the Father adopts me into the family. I am a part of God's family. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts so that we, listen to this, crying out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is literally the most intimate name that you can call a father. It, a, lot of, a lot of translations, new translations, well, you may even translate it, Abba is actually the, the original language word, but it can be translated like Papa or Dad. So what happens is Jesus goes to the cross. He redeems a people that God then takes in as his children. And he puts the, his spirit inside of us so that we get to call God Papa. Yes. Dad. I mean, that is remarkable. Yes. So that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then an heir through God. Listen to me, guys. Listen very carefully to me. And we're done. Listen. We as believers 
are experiencing God the Father in a way that David could only dream about. When David says in verse 10, God will take me in. The Lord will take me in. David had could only imagine what the gospel of Jesus Christ has actually done to make that true for everybody that's in Christ. So I want you to listen to me. Your earthly relationships are not the primary relationships in your life. Listen, listen, listen to me here. Your earthly relationships are not the primary relationship in your life. The primary relationships in your life are number one, your relationship with God. Listen, your relationship with God as an adopted son or daughter and your relationship with other children of God. Some of you in here, you have been abandoned by fathers. Maybe multiple times in your life has a father abandoned you. A mother has abandoned you. Parents have not loved you properly. They haven't been for you what they should have been for you. Instead of making, instead of letting that make you bitter and angry and resentful and just mess you up, give them over to the Lord. Say, God, you got to deal with them. I can't change them. I can't fix them. I, you got to deal with them, and realize that God the Father has taken you in. And he is for you what an earthly father or mother could never be anyway. I do biblical math all the time with you guys. And I want to do it again in this context. Listen to me, in this context. You could have the greatest mother and father in the world. Right? You could have the greatest mother or father in the world. But if you don't have Jesus, you got nothing. You could have the worst father and mother in the world. But if you got Jesus, you got everything. Listen to me, man. Listen to me. This is unbelievable. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that is true for human relationships as well. It's true. We got to get our minds on that. I love that David says it like this. My father and mother may abandon me. Because I know the I know that I'm feeling like God may abandon me. Please stop, woman. I know that I'm feeling like God may abandon me, and I know that those emotions and those fears are real. But there's a truth I know that's going to overpower all that. God always takes me. Always takes me. So just grab a hold of that truth. Let that sit on you. Be encouraged today. What happens? God will never hide his face from you. He will never turn away in anger. He will never cast you away and forsake you. He will always take you in because you are his 